we have exciting news here in Quans County. It's not every day that we have a chance to interview and talk with members of the CDC, but it's not us doing the interview. It's actually students from the Centerville Middle School. The Retrievers are here in the building, and we have Avery, Natalie, and Amelia, who are going to be interviewing members from the CDC to talk about topics that they researched in school. They reached out to the CDC, hoping just to get an answer about a couple of questions they had, and lo and behold, they actually got a full-on interview. So we're here to kind of document the whole thing, see what they do, get some information, and show you how awesome it is to have these programs colliding today. So ladies, thanks for joining us. Thank Can you introduce you. yourself? Yes, I'm Avery. And I'm Natalie. And today you're here to interview Lieutenant Sam Sincata about penicillin, correct? Yes. All right, we're going to let you take it away. And Sam, if you could say hi for us, and then we're going to start rolling. Hello, Centerville Middle School. Oh, hello, Avery. Hello, Natalie. Uh, hello. Excited to uh, answer your questions today, so go ahead. Okay, our first question is what impact did penicillin have on modern medicine? I think that's a great question. You know, the impact of penicillin on modern medicine really comes down, in my mind, to three, three, three categories. So deadly diseases, prophylaxis for high-risk procedures, and being a model mechanism uh, for future antibiotics. So before penicillin came around, there, there were only a few antibiotics available, and they really didn't treat uh, many of the deadly diseases, many of the common deadly diseases. So having uh, an, uh, having penicillin really, really changed modern medicine uh, in our ability to treat deadly diseases. But as far as prophylaxis, we were able to do high-risk procedures such as surgeries, childbirth, things like that by giving individuals uh, antibiotics beforehand, and that really prevented them from uh, developing diseases, bacterial infections uh, before uh, or during the procedures. And as a model for uh, future antibiotics, penicillin, as one of our first antibiotics, is it's amazing that many of our current antibiotics and all of our uh, many of our future antibiotics use the same uh, mechanism of action, just how they uh, uh, either stop or kill bacteria. So very influential on modern medicine. Um, how was the discovery of penicillin a turning point in history and disease research? I think, I think as I just said, um, for history, you know, this was really the first time that we were reliably able to treat deadly diseases. So having that in our, uh, you know, armamentarium, our, our, you know, arsenal of what we can treat patients with vastly changed history. But we got to consider uh, when uh, penicillin was discovered, which was during the Second World War. So it was also very influential on history in that regard. So Fleming, who discovered penicillin, was uh, his laboratory was in London in the United, Ki United Kingdom. And uh, the work that uh, furthered penicillin was also done in the United Kingdom. So it was really the British and the Americans that uh, Took the next steps of uh, producing in a, in a mass mass quality in a quantity uh, penicillin, and they were able to treat the Allied forces. So um, during the war, and it, it really wasn't until the end of the war that the Germans had penicillin and were able to utilize it also. Um, and as far as disease research, I think at the time there is a big emphasis on not antibiotics, but on bacteriophage, bacteriophages, so really harnessing viruses to attack bacteria. Um, and it, it really, really ch changed the uh, course of disease research more towards antibiotics. And that's really uh, how, how we fight bacterial infections today. Okay, um, how did the Oxford team contribute to the discovery of penicillin? That's great, yeah. I, I mentioned it a little bit uh, in the previous question, but you know, the Oxford team, they really continued Fleming's work. Uh, I, I think it was uh, Ernst, uh, it was Ernst, I forgot the name, uh, but one, one of the members of the team uh, read Fleming's work 10 years later and decided that, you know, he, he could figure out how to really isolate penicillin from the mold um, that was growing penicillin, that, that grew penicillin. 
And they, they not only were able to isolate penicillin, but they were also able to produce it and eventually mass produce it. And they furthered the work even further by doing the first clinical studies, uh, not only in, uh, in mice, uh, but also in humans. Um, but again, since this was during the, the war, uh, they, they kept their work secret. And uh, it was not largely known that they were uh, involved in the discovery uh, of penicillin until a little bit after the war. Yes. How long, how, how, how did the Oxford team change penicillin into modern medicine after Fleming gave up on it? And I, I don't know that Fleming really gave up on penicillin. He, he, came, he came to a roadblock. He came to a problem, and it was really the Oxford team that uh, you know found the solution to the problem that uh, Fleming couldn't uh, um, you know find find an answer to. So they they more or less continued the research, and that's how the scientific world works. You know, people discover problems, they try to find answers to those problems, and it, it just happened to be the Oxford team that, uh, you know, really found the solution to uh, the roadblocks that uh, Fleming had. Okay, um, how long have we been using penicillin and how important is it? So we've been using penicillin, uh, so during, since World War II, so that's uh, the early to mid 1940s. Um, and it was vitally important then, it's vitally important now. Um, and I think, Really, I, I talked about it in the first question. The, the importance of penicillin these days really lies in the mechanism of action. So penicillin is in a, a class of antibiotics, a larger class of antibiotics called uh, beta-lactams. And it's, it's really the new, even the newer uh, antibiotics today are mainly beta-lactams, but they're combined with um, uh, other uh, antibiotics that help prevent resistance. So you know, we've been using this for many years, and it's still vitally relevant today, vitally important. And they're going to continue, this class of antibiotics is, will help us continue to treat our sickest patients. But it, it is also vitally important for us to, you know, really not spread uh, bacteria in the healthcare setting. So not only is it important, but it, it teaches us lessons that outside of antibiotics, there's really important things that we can do to prevent people from getting sick. Um, what were the flaws of penicillin when it was discovered? Sorry, what were the flaws of penicillin? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, so the, the flaw was really largely around Fleming not being able to isolate uh, the actual penicillin. So, it, 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 yeah, it, it's, it's really around the, the mass production or being able to produce it in a, in a manner that could be used in patients. So Fleming knew that it had antibacterial com compounds, but he really couldn't isolate it and put it into like normal clinical use. How were common diseases treated before penicillin? I think it was more, uh, you know, patient management, uh, just keeping them healthy. And uh, there was some work, as I, I said before, around bacteriophages. So just really trying to find a virus that could attack the bacteria but it was more around you know more <laughs> more more topical solutions and not more systemic uh uh solutions like uh, antibiotics mm -hmm. what made alexander fleming interested in penicillin penicillium mold when he first discovered it researchers of the time, they were trying to find new antibiotics. And uh, Fleming found that this uh, mold inhibited bacterial growth uh, in his lab. So he just really went forward with, uh, uh, you know, being able to produce it and being able to research it more to see if uh, it could be useful in clinical medicine. Um. How many soldiers did Alexander Fleming attempt to cure with penicillin? That I'm not gonna lie. I do not. I do not have an exact answer for that. Um, and uh, you know what? <laughs> you may have to research that a little bit further. But I know Fleming was involved in the war, just like everybody else was. And 
since he couldn't produce uh, penicillin on a large quantity, I don't think that it would have been too uh, too much research on his end. Mm -hmm. um, once film, once filming first discovered penicillin, what was the process of getting it implanted on what on wide scale production? How long did how long did that take? So I, I think I could be uh, wrong with the years, but I think uh, penicillin was first uh, documented in the 1929. And then the Oxford team really took up the work in like, let's say 1940. So the early forties. And they, like I said, they worked with the US. So they worked with the federal government of the United States and also drug companies within the United States uh, in order to figure out a way how to mass produce penicillin. And I think we can we can say that maybe they could treat 10 patients at most, 10 to 30 patients at most in the first year. But within two or two and a half years, they had produced enough penicillin to treat the whole entire allied forces. So many, many soldiers. Um, how much of an impact did penicillin have on infected patients? Uh, it Penicillin had an immediate impact. I, one story um, from the Oxford team when they first created penicillin, where first produced the the isolated penicillin, is the the first uh, patient they treated. It was a police officer in London, and he had uh, a widespread disease, and they were able to give him a uh, penicillin, and within twenty four hours, um, he he showed sign, signs of improvement. But they didn't have enough penicillin to give them a full course of uh, antibiotics. So uh, eventually, he he unfortunately did pass away. But there was marketed improvement um, immediately after giving uh, the antibiotic. Where can we find good sources for our research? Uh, the best the best source that I know um, is, uh, and I can share it with you. I, I'll I'll share it with you. Is a, a, a of research, a scientific article written by a, a previous CDC member, and it's it's really about the the history of penicillin. Um, and I'll I'll pass it on to your uh, teacher for you. Thank you. Um, how was penicillin turned into other antibiotics like amoxicillin, and who made other antibiotics from penicillin? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. Amoxicillin is also in the beta lactam class of antibiotics, uh, very similar to penicillin. And as I said, it was really after penicillin was first uh, discovered and produced widely, that was that changed modern medicine, as we talked about. And it really created a research need on creating more antibiotics. So it, ever, ever since penicillin was uh, discovered and produced, uh, the, the research world uh, has been searching for uh, New new antibiotics um, to be produced. So it, it's been the the work of all of researchers, medical researchers. How did penicillin change the population of people? As, as being pen, penicillin has saved numerous lives. Uh, being able to treat infectious diseases for the first time in a reliable manner has increased public health uh, tremendously and has saved the lives of many people and prevented uh, innumerable, uncountable disease, diseases from ever being, uh, you know, from ever happening. Um, that's all the questions we have today. Okay, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I have a question for you all. Uh, what made you so interested in penicillin? Why did you guys select this? Well, we knew that it penicillin that the discovery of penicillin was like the first like major major yeah. antibiotic yeah and it it made the human we knew it made the human population go up because if someone got like the common cold or flu they could be cured with antibiotics today that's great i appreciate the questions and uh and it's it's amazing that you guys uh, are interested in it, and I, I encourage you to keep keep uh, you know learning about uh, medicine, not only penicillin.
Thank you. All right, before I let you guys off the hook, uh, Avery, Natalie, you did a wonderful job. Thank you. And if, Thank you. if your note taken, Avery, is any uh, sign, I believe your teacher is going to have a, about a 40-page book report to, to read by the time you guys are done. <laughs> but be before I let you go, I was wondering, Sam, if I could ask just two quick questions. I was wondering, how exciting is it to get a chance to speak with students and have them ask and answer questions like this? You know, it's amazing. You know, it, a lot of my job is talking to the same people, same uh, about the same topic all the time. But it's not often that I, I get middle schoolers that I get Avery and Natalie asking me questions about uh, penicillin. So it, it's been the highlight of my day, the highlight of my week uh, preparing. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and I have to know if there's just one question that you thought they were going to ask that they didn't. Like, I can't believe we didn't have zombies come up. <laughs> Is there something that you thought they might have asked? thought they would have asked uh, uh, specific questions about uh, uh, one of the common myths that goes around penicillin, just allergies around penicillins. They pro they could have stumped me. They should have they should have tried to ask some really hard allergy questions, but uh, they didn't. So thank you, guys. Awesome. <laughs> Sam, thank you so much for your time. And Avery and Natalie, wonderful job again. And we're going to switch you. over and do our next interview. Our next interview is going to be with Dr. Christina Nelson, and it's going to be conducted by Amelia because she wants to ask about the plague. So we have our visiting uh, CDC member all the way from Colorado to answer some questions. Amelia, take it away. How was the plague a turning point in medicine and disease research? Yeah, that's a great question, Amelia. So, you know, the plague has affected the world for many, many years, centuries, thousands of years. And so at various times, there's been various opportunities for kind of intervention and research. They didn't actually discover the bacteria that causes plague until the late 1800s. So for a long time, they were trying to control the plague whenever outbreaks would happen, but they didn't actually know that a bacteria caused it. And so there wasn't much research going on in terms of the bacteria and how to treat it. It was really kind of responsive to all the sick patients who were coming in and people who were dying. I will say, though, that one kind of highlight in the history of plague and how it, um, it was kind of a turning point um, for medicine and investigation was the, the latest, the most recent very large outbreak of plague um, happened. It started in Hong Kong um, in 1894, and that's around when Alexander Yersin discovered the bacteria that caused plague, which is called Yersinia pestis. And there was a very famous doctor, his name was Wu Lin Te, and he was very instrumental, very involved in this plague outbreak, studied it a lot, was starting to realize it was caused by a bacteria. They still didn't have antibiotics, but he really did amazing public health work in understanding that when the bacteria goes to the lungs, people can cough and infect other people. And so he really developed a lot of, of great public health measures to prevent plague and prevent the spread just by observing and learning about this infection and this illness. So he wanted patients spread apart from each other when they were in the hospital. He wanted good ventilation in the hospitals because he didn't want patients um, getting the infection from other patients. Um, he wore a mask whenever he saw patients, and he tried to keep his distance unless he was examining them. If he was listening to their lungs, he would have the patient face away so that they weren't coughing on him. He understood all of these things and really made a lot of progress in terms of public health, how, how you can prevent disease uh, by simple measures. Um, and he, he actually, people say that he was kind of the first inventor or the first person who popularized using a mask um, to prevent infection. So I would say that was really one of the turning points and one of the really interesting things um, related to plague and the study of medicine and bacteria. All right, what was the main problem at the bubonic plague? The main problem with bubonic plague is that it's an infection um, that can really take over your body and cause severe infection throughout the body. So um, my colleague here has pulled up some pictures. The reason it's called a, a it's called bubonic plague is it causes what's called a bubo. And that's based on a Greek word for groin, actually. But um, bubo is when the bacteria and white blood cells all collect 
in a lymph node and it causes this very large swelling. So on, on the left, you can see a patient with a bubo in his neck, that, that large thing that looks like an egg under the skin is a lymph node that's infected. It's very, very painful. And the bacteria can spread from there to the rest of the body and cause severe illness and even death. So that's the main problem with um, bubonic plague. Um, as you can see here, it was also called bumps disease in the middle ages. And you can see this little poor little baby here on the right has a bubo in the armpit. And that's a common place. Often people can be infected maybe on their arm or their hand by a flea bite or other exposure. The bacteria travels through the blood and the lymph system to the, um, to the armpit and kind of collects there. So that is a common spot where we see bubos. Does the medication or treatment have any major side effects that are like concerning? Yes. So with many medications, you know, they're, they're very helpful when used in the right way and save lives, but there are often side effects for a variety of medications. Um, so the first, uh, the first antibiotic that was discovered that can treat plague is streptomycin. So um, uh, Sam Chinchata, who you spoke with recently, uh, or your colleagues spoke with recently, he talked about penicillin. And that was one of the first antibiotics to be discovered. Penicillin actually doesn't work um, against plague. But in the 1940s, uh, the streptomycin was discovered. And um, that is a very good drug for tuberculosis, which was common at the time, um, but also found to be effective for plague. So really life-saving. Um, before I get to the um, kind of side effects or the problems with streptomycin, I just wanted to point out how monumental and how kind of world-changing this discovery was. So before streptomycin, many, many people died of plague. Um, if plague went to the lungs, almost every person who had um, the bacteria in their lungs died. Um, there is a quote from Dr. Wu Linti, who I mentioned, um, who investigated and helped manage the outbreak in China. He said, for all practical purposes, the prognosis of primary pneumonic plague, so meaning um, if someone has plague in the lungs, may be considered as well nigh hopeless. So he's basically saying for all practi practical purposes, if someone has plague in the lungs, it's hopeless. There's no cure. So this was before streptomycin. In the 1940s, once streptomycin was discovered and once it was tested and found um, to be effective for plague, um, Someone said in 1949, uh, Dr. Meyer and S.F. Kwan, for the first time in the history of plague, a drug which will cure the pneumonic form has been found. So again, this was monumental. It saved many, many lives. Finally, they had a treatment for plague. Um, there are side effects and things to be worried about with streptomycin and other antibiotics in that class. So streptomycin actually can affect nerves and particularly hearing. So um, streptomycin can cause people to actually have hearing loss um, if it's used enough and cause, causes enough um, hearing damage. And streptomycin actually also can really affect the kidneys. So these days when people get streptomycin, it's not used very commonly, but often others in the same family are still used. They, um, the doctors have to monitor how a patient's kidneys are working and kind of adjust the dose because if they get too much, it can cause damage to the kidneys. So you always have to balance the risks and benefits. So, you know, streptomycin is life-saving for plague. It's still used in places like Madagascar, very important drug. Um, it's important to be aware of these side effects and be careful about them. Um, but again, the drug saves lives. So it's important to um, get that on board when you can. What is the process for someone to be cured of the plague? So as I mentioned, plague is treatable with antibiotics. Um, so the most important thing is to get antibiotics on board as soon as possible. If someone has bubonic plague, if you get the antibiotics on board within the first three to five days, usually they can be cured. If someone has plague in the lungs, it's really, really important to get those antibiotics on board within the first um, one to two days. Uh, the infection can really um, spread to the body and cause severe illness very, very quickly. So people can be cured. The main, the most important thing is antibiotics, getting those on board. Uh, 
A family member of streptomycin, gentamicin, is a commonly used antibiotic to treat plague these days. Also, doxycycline and ciprofloxacin, those are kind of the main ones that we know are effective, but there are other options. Getting those on board as soon as possible, very, very important. Uh, but there are other some there are some other supportive things that um, healthcare providers can do. Um, often patients with plague are very sick, so they need extra fluids. Um, they need extra support. They may not actually need a breathing tube to help them breathe. Um, so there's other things you can do to support a patient and help them pull through and survive. But most important, again, is getting those antibiotics on board. If someone is in medical confines, like a hospital, how long does it take to cure the person? Yeah, so there's a lot of variability. Um, we recommend, again, getting the antibiotics on, on board as soon as possible. Typically, we recommend treating for 10 to 14 days, but the antibiotics for plague sometimes can really appear or look like a, a miracle drug. Um, patients, especially who have the bacteria in their lungs, they're having trouble breathing, they're coughing up blood, they're very, very sick. And within 24 hours of receiving the antibiotic, they can look substantially better. Um, so they, many patients appear better and are feeling better within 24 hours of receiving that first dose of the antibiotics. But we do recommend treatment for 10 to 14 days just to make sure the bacteria is completely cleared. And then um, most patients are doing well uh, and able to be discharged from the hospital after that. But some patients who have very severe infections, sometimes it takes them longer and you may have to extend the treatment. And Amelia, I know this is a lot to take in and write down. So we're happy to share some resources. I know you had a question about that too, but, but we're happy to send articles and other things. Um, so you, if you miss some things, we're happy to answer questions afterwards. Oh, all right. How many stages are there in the plague, if there are? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are not necessarily stages of the plague, but we do have what we call primary clinical forms or primary forms of the disease and secondary forms. So most people who initially present with plague um, most commonly have one of three different forms. So there's bubonic plague, which we talked about, where the bacteria go to the lymph node and cause a very large, painful, painful swelling. There's pneumonic plague, where the bacteria initially are inhaled and are infecting the lung. And then there's what we call septic, septicemic plague, where patients are very, very sick, high fever, very weak, but there's no kind of local, um, there's no local sign like a bubo or a cough or anything that's pointing to a specific spot for the infection. So those are the three primary forms that are most common. There's other um, forms that people can people can get. They can get it in the throat. They can get kind of intestinal plague also um, and other forms, but those are the main primary forms. There is what you could consider a secondary phase. So if initially someone has bubonic plague and then the bacteria spread to the rest of the body in the blood or the lungs, then they can get kind of this second phase or secondary form where they get plague pneumonia or other things. What if a patient has an allergic reaction to the medicine to cure the plague? Yeah, so some people are allergic to various antibiotics. Um, Sam had mentioned penicillin allergies, and um, there are people who are allergic to streptomycin or doxycycline or ciprofloxacin. Usually you can tell early on if someone is allergic to an antibiotic. So, you know, they'll develop a rash or they'll feel uncomfortable, have maybe have trouble breathing if it's a severe reaction. So if someone does have an allergic reaction, um, hopefully that would be picked up early on. And the good news is for plague, there are various classes, kind of different families of antibiotics that are effective in treating plague. So you could switch from one family of antibiotics to a different family. There is some kind of cross reactivity, we say. So if someone's allergic to one class, they could be allergic to another class. But generally speaking, it's a lot safer if someone has an allergy for one family of antibiotics. Usually you can switch to another family that's very different or very distinct um, and be okay and not have an allergic reaction and still be able to treat that infection. Do patients that have been cured suffer any long-term effects from the plague or treatment? You know, usually not. 
um, patients, as I mentioned, patients who have plague can be very, very sick. So they can be very weak. Um, they actually, plague can cause um, problems with circulation to the fingers or to the toes. And it actually can cause that tissue to die and turn black. So um, that's actually why it's called the Black Death. And we can show pictures if you want to see them, or we can send them later. Um, and unfortunately, when that happens, the, the fingers or toes or sometimes the tip of the nose need to be amputated. So that can be a long-term effect of plague when people have very, very ser serious disease and severe infection. Apart from that, though, most people who recover from plague, you know, it can be a long recovery. Their body's been really kind of put through the ringer with this infection. It's a severe infection. and They're in the hospital. They might even need help breathing uh, with a breathing tube. But usually after they recover and they're discharged from the hospital, we don't see any long-term effects other than kind of weakness and a long recovery period. But usually, other than that problem of potential amputations for some patients, usually there aren't a lot of long-term effects, thankfully. Once they first discovered the cure, what was the process for it getting like available on like a wide place of production? Yeah, so this, this is a good question because it's kind of true for all new treatments that are discovered. You know, you, you discover something, whether it be an antibiotic or an antiviral or some other drug to treat high blood pressure or other things. So you have to prove that it works and you have to prove that it's safe. And then once that's done and people agree that this would be beneficial, then it has to be manufactured on a larger scale. So my understanding of the history of streptomycin is after it was discovered at Rutgers, they did some animal studies in guinea pigs. I think really the focus then was on tuberculosis. As I mentioned, that was a big problem during that time and still is today. So they did some animal studies to make sure it was safe in guinea pigs and possibly other animals too. Um, and then they have to show that it works for the diseases. And so there was some indication or some evidence that this medication was effective for treating various infections. And my understanding is that Merck, a pharmaceutical company, was actually working on penicillin at the time and producing penicillin. And the researchers and others kind of had to convince Merck, this pharmaceutical company, um, to produce streptomycin as well, kind of on a larger scale. So when they discovered it, they just had a small amount in the lab, but then this drug, streptomycin, as with other medicines that are discovered, needs to be created or manufactured on a larger scale. And that takes either a company or a government agency to bring it kind of to a manufacturing facility or a factory and be able to make larger quantities. So that's what initially happened back in the 1940s. And that's what happens today uh, is that drug companies around the world and other manufacturers will make these drugs um, so that they can be available on a larger scale. How much of an impact did the medication have on the infected patients? Yeah, so we, we touched on this some, you know, it really was kind of monumental world changing for plague specifically, you know, this, um, the antibiotics weren't available until the 1940s that were effective against plague, but once they were discovered, they really improved survival rates, helped patients survived kind of astoundingly. Um, patients with plague pneumonia, really without antibiotics, almost all of them die. Patients with bubonic plague, about 50% or about half of them will die without antibiotics. But with antibiotics, if, they're, if they get on board, if the patient's treated kind of earlier in the course of the disease, nearly all patients can survive. Um, not all patients, some of them get treatment late. Some of them have disease so severe or, or other complications that they can't survive. But for the most part, patients with plague who are diagnosed and treated early in the disease can survive thanks to these antibiotics. And um, it really has helped, you know, in outbreaks. For example, there was an outbreak in Madagascar in 2017. Patients were treated with streptomycin and other medications, uh, and that really helped patients survive, and it still does today. How was the plague treated in the Middle Ages, and how did it change over time? Yeah, so as I mentioned, they didn't have antibiotics. They didn't even know that plague was caused by a bacteria. They didn't know that it was an infection. 
So they didn't really have that many tools uh, to treat plague. And there were a lot of kind of myths and other things. People would sell herbs and other things, you know, that ultimately didn't work. Um, but there were some things that were interesting that seemed to be somewhat effective, not necessarily in terms of treatment, but potentially in preventing disease. So um, this is a picture of the plague doctor. People have probably seen images of this. It kind of looks like a bird. And this is kind of a classic image of plague in the Middle Ages. You know, the plague doctor would go around and see patients and kind of quarantine people or make, make them stay in their house if, if the household had an infected person. And this is kind of a mythic figure. It's very recognizable. Sometimes people dress up like this for Halloween, um, but it actually probably had some purpose. So you can see the plague doctor is wearing a mask. It's kind of a very funny beak-like mask. And there were various reasons and myths for that. But as we talked about before, for people who have the bacteria in their lungs, people who have plague pneumonia, they can cough up the bacteria and infect other people. So it's actually helpful to wear a mask. And so this, um, even though it looks funny and it was kind of this mythic character, um, actually had some purpose. And he's kind of wearing glasses that probably protects the bacteria from getting into his eyes. Um, and then you can see the stick. So we, it's understood that the stick was probably used to keep people away from him. So he didn't want people kind of swarming around him. He didn't want the patients getting too close to him. Um, and that was also probably effective because plague can be transmitted from one person to another if the bacteria is in the lungs and the, the patient is coughing and spreading the bacteria. So the stick actually probably was helpful in preventing at least the plague doctor from getting sick. Um, the long robes may have helped from getting his um, clothing contaminated, but maybe also just, you know, kind of showed people that he was official and kind of this um, morbid character and to be feared. Um, but they did, even back in the Middle Ages, like I said, there wasn't really any way to treat plague. They didn't know it was caused by a bacteria. They didn't have antibiotics, but they did kind of quarantine families and households who had plague. And that probably helped with some spread. So in London, for example, if, if a, a family had plague, they would kind of get a big mark on their door and they weren't allowed to leave. Um, and there were kind of people who would um, police that and make sure that the families didn't leave. And so those were kind of basic public health measures that while they didn't save the individual patients, most patients died of plague, they did actually probably help um, prevent further spread of the disease. Where is the most common area of, of plague cases today? Yeah, so that brings up an important point. Plague actually occurs today uh, worldwide and including in the United States. So most people think of plague as the Black Death um, and something that happened only in the Middle Ages, but it does still happen. So that's a really good question. So still happens in the Western United States. Um, we get usually five to 15 cases a year that are reported to CDC in the United States. Um, that varies. Sometimes some years we have zero cases. Sometimes we have more than 15, maybe up to the 20s. Um, many states that are infected, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, that area um, are see usually the most cases, but we also get cases from Oregon, Washington, California, so Western United States. Uh, but plague also occurs around the world. So Africa, I mentioned the recent outbreak in 2017 in Madagascar. There are also cases and outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, and other countries. Uh, plague, can, plague still occurs in Asia. You can see cases in Russia, China, other areas, Kazakhstan, other countries. Um, and plague still occurs in South America. So Peru, um, sometimes Bolivia, and sometimes other countries um, can still have places, uh, cases of plague as well. And while you're writing, I actually just realized this was an accident, but I actually have a plague mug. So you can see the bacteria <laughs> oh, wow. on my mug here. Yersinia pestis is what it's called. I think that's all the questions. Well, thank you for the good questions, Amelia. Sounds like you did some research initially, and I hear you're a hard worker. So good luck with your project and good luck with the competition. All right. Good job, Amelia. So Dr. Nelson, why I have you real quick, two questions for you also. Is having the chance to speak with students like this something you get to do often? 
you know, we do do this once in a while um, and it's always enjoyable and fun. It's, it's really interesting to talk to students and hear their questions and answer their questions. Um, so I'd say we, we correspond with students probably a half, at least a half dozen times a year, you know, we'll get emails with questions and we're happy to answer those questions. Um, but we do kind of live interviews or phone interviews um, at least a few times a year. And it's always very interesting. Awesome. That's so cool to hear. I never would have thought about it, but it's really great that you guys are out in the communities, out with the schools, and just helping to educate, which we always look forward to. So, but we got to meet three amazing students today. I'm just wondering, are there going to be some intern desks waiting for them in the future when they're done with college? Maybe in Colorado, maybe all around the United States. You know, potentially. I'd, I'd be really interested to see these reports and see how they come out. I heard I heard all these young women are hard workers, so that's great. Um, but it is it is a good question because CDC does have opportunities for students. Um, so and for people who are non-students, so there actually is a CDC museum in Atlanta, the David Sensor Museum, um, where people can go and kind of learn about public health and the history of CDC. Um, but there also is a disease detective camp that students can go to and kind of learn about public health and science. Um, and there's also kind of work site experiences and other internships that CDC offers. So cdc.gov is the uh, website and people can go there and kind of search for opportunities. But we, we are always happy to educate people and have people on site and working with us and learning. Well, that's wonderful. Well, it sounds like we have a great place to send our students on that website. It sounds like, uh, Mr. Anders, you have your field trip now planned. You're going to Atlanta. <laughs> Well, we can't thank Lieutenant Sincata and Dr. Nelson enough. They really helped out with uh, Avery, Natalie, and Amelia today. It was a wonderful experience learning about the discovery of penicillin and some history and knowledge about the plague. But we're out of time. So that means my expose on the zombie outbreak is going to have to wait till next year. So hopefully, Mr. Andrews, your class will work on that. And maybe we can get another interview with the CDC. So thank you all for your time. Thank you for the Centerville Middle School and the CDC for their time. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next year, hopefully.